and welcome back to another episode of OKO, a Pokemon VGC podcast. World Championships has just happened. There's a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into it. Sierra Don, Joe Brown, your usual host, back to be talking about all this stuff. It has been it has been a little bit. I know, unfortunately, we weren't able to record while in Hawaii. I'm so sorry about that. It kind of once we were in Hawaii, I don't know if you feel the same here, but everything kind of hit you really fast. Like it was non-stop stuff happening between like rehearsals and prepping and the actual broadcast yeah it was right and also to uh, everybody i i still have not recovered my voice from casting the world championship so i apologize if i sound a little raspy this episode but uh it doesn't hurt to talk so don't worry um but uh i i agree with you that it was kind of difficult to find a spot that we could like record for an hour and a half that wouldn't be interrupted by people walking through or people talking loudly in the background and stuff we had some ideas but the day uh, you blink, you start your day at 7 a.m. and you blink and it was already like nine o'clock at night. <laughs> you know what I mean? So just there was a lot going on in Hawaii. Yeah, I, we tried to find a time during rehearsal, but um, like we're there. We're there to cast. So that um, it came first. Before we get into the world championships, though, normally we take a second to talk about what we've been up to since um, I just been sleeping and um, streaming because just got back. But uh, you're right. I know you had some exciting news of what you're up to tonight. Yeah, it turns out Luca's not the only war champion we'll be talking about tonight on OCO because I just came back from my One Piece local tournament. My first one since, like, the beginning of July because I've been gone for a month, <laughs> essentially, and I won the local. I went 5-0. and oh. My first time I've ever won a local. I've top cut uh, a couple locals before, but my first ever victory, and uh, it was... I was very nervous going to the last round. I went on to I went on the stream in the last round that the the store holds for every event, and uh, had some friends watching in the chat room me on, and I could feel it came home with the dub. I like how <laughs> you just compared yourself to Luca or world champion, <laughs> yeah. like because I won a like twenty five player local when he won worlds. Congrats, though. I, I I was streaming and you had like updated me that you were like undefeated at one point. And I said it and they're like, yo, like Joe Brown plays one piece. Yo, he's undefeated. Like they're hyped for you. So like oh, you, had, you had people you. recorded there, too. So but, but congrats there. Yeah. This is Pokemon. This is well, Pokemon just, just well, you're one, last, one your last thing. One yeah. last comment. I just because I posted on Twitter and I think the great, the wise, the CCG commentator, Chip Ritchie made a statement. He said a win for Joe Brown is a win for all of us. So. <laughs> I think I think Chip Chip makes a lot of salient points there with that statement. I I don't even know what to say to that. I <laughs> I, I trust I trust in Chip Ritchie, but it just seems like a little bit of self lazing at this point of like, yo, Chip said I'm the greatest, and like you know he's so right. I mean, you know, it's his job to analyze card games for a living, so you know I'll take his word for it. All right, all right, but congrats on that, but uh. The World Championships, we weren't too concerned about the card games because we were all in on the VGC. I mean, my my first impression of Hawaii is it actually seems incredibly insane that it's done already. I don't... It seemed like it took forever to Worlds to get there, and then a second it started happening. Like, it's all... It's all done. <laughs> it's like, just what? a blur, right? And you got yeah. there early, right? Like, I got there Wednesday night, so I didn't even really... Get to do too much uh, tourism things, but like, what were what were some of the days you did before, or what were some of the things you did before our rehearsal day? So I ended up getting like their midday Monday, so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't too jet lagged. I did have the option to get in there a few days um, early because of that. So the first night was kind of just more like meet up with people and just like chill. It's like the biggest thing for any of the competitions, regionals, ICs, world championships, anything like the friends that I have in this game. It's like, I, I want to see them. I want to go to dinner with them. I want to hang out with them. So that's what we ended up doing the first day. And then the second day as well. And then on the, it was the Tuesday or the Wednesday. Um, one of the two, I ended up going um, for a drive with Rose, Pangy, Gabby, Chalky. And we drove out to, like, this Buddhist temple, which was super, super cool. And they had, like, this food that you could feed, like, the fish and the birds outside with. So then we fed birds for, like, 30 minutes. It was awesome. I got to hold, like, three birds at once. Great day. Great time. Um, also saw, like, history stuff, you know. But, the like, I held, The flying gym leader, Sierra, holding like, the birds. Held some birds. So it was great. And then we wanted to go to, like, these botanical gardens. But they ended up closing really early. Um... And, like, we left late enough that, like, regardless of how long we spent at the Buddhist temple, we couldn't do both. 
So we looked up kind of hikes in the area, and there was like this, I think it was called like this friendship hike or something. So we went on this hike, and it wasn't like the longest hike, but it had a really cool look out like over everything. So we got to see that. I got some pictures from it that I'll probably post in the Discord after this episode goes live. But it was just like kind of really cute. And then other than that, just like hanging out with people. You got there, then like right away we got rehearsals, and then the weekend started going. Yeah, I had, um, I got there Wednesday, kind of nightish. My flight, there were a lot of flight delays out of LAX that like the first one impacted the next flight, which impacted the next. And like I ran into multiple Pokemon mm. people in LA. Like that were like I was supposed to have a ten AM flight and mine got pushed to one. And then one of my friends she was like, Oh, well, I was on the one and now I'm on the three. And then I met another player, he's like, Well, I was on the three, and now I'm on the six thirty. Like it just kind of like pushed everybody. Uh so that was a that was rough that uh if I didn't have that three hour delay, we probably could have recorded the podcast on one And that was, was just that was sucks. the time block we had, right. which that just was our, off wrong. <laughs> that was our plan. So shout outs to LAX for uh you know, making us miss a week of the pod, but, um, and then, yeah, you, you, me, we, you, me, we went out with some of the Unite crew, uh, to have ramen on, on Wednesday night, which was yeah. a lot of fun. And I love the, I love the Unite crew. They're always so fun. Such good, so uh, such good vibes, but like we kind of went right into it with the rehearsal on Thursday, at least yeah. from my perspective. And then I spent Thursday night just getting prepared, trying to look up matchups and like going to bed early, really. So I didn't you know feel bad going into it on Friday. And, I would say besides Monday when we went to the mall and like had some fun and stuff, like I really didn't do too many touristy things. Like I guess that's on me because I could have planned out. So I think could have went to Pearl Harbor, could have went to stuff, but like I was sweating. You know, it was hot. Like yeah, your so. your Monday trip was yeah. meeting me, Joe, the Chewest Brady at Raising Canes. Um. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I had my first ever Raising Canes experience in uh, in Honolulu, and you know what? <laughs> I don't know what Ugarte is on about. It's fine. It's not. It's not life altering. Like I could. I. I did not have a malasada in Honolulu, which was my w- number one objective the whole weekend. So I would like to have a malasada just like my friends from Pokemon Sun and Moon do. And because Joe wanted me to go to Raising Cane's instead, I did not. In- I did not get to eat a malasada. The true testament of friendship, right? I, I would say you, so. you you could you could have ditched because like we did invite you to go to the escape room beforehand with us because we had a group go to the escape room and you did ditch on that so well i didn't ditch if i wasn't like, a part hold, hold on hold on i didn't ditch if i wasn't a part of the original escape room plan that's not ditching you just we invited like, people along the way you're good no, no, no well first of all i don't like escape rooms it makes me feel dumb and i don't like feeling dumb because i never figure out the puzzles so i just sit there with my hands in a book thinking like oh does this code matter you know whatever uh so i'm not i'm not an escape room guy you let you guys love escape rooms i'm just saying it's not ditching if i wasn't a part of the original plan i appreciate the that you extended the invitation especially because you did it with seijun and i think i would have just fangirled the whole time in the corner if i was yeah doing... i got to do an escape <laughs> Station Park, like how yeah. cool is that? We're I, talking about I Hawaii highlights. Oh my god! I don't think I would. I legitimately do not think I would have been able to handle being locked in an escape room for an hour with Sage without fangirling. He solved the final puzzle too. He, oh, clutched, nice. he clutched up at the very end as we all stood there dumbfounded. So like, <laughs> yeah, like kudos there. No, that was a that was a cool moment. I got to. I won't fangirl too much because I did that on broadcast multiple times since I got to cast this game. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I told you they weren't gonna have Malasadas at the airport. Like I'm, I'm sorry, Dude, been right, the airport. Like... On, honestly, Sierra, if I could just take a little thirty second yeah. tangent, I've never seen la- such a lack of urgency in my entire life that I saw at the Honolulu airport. When I got there, there was one dude. There was like a line of like twenty five people trying to check their bags. He wasn't even lifting people's bags. Like there was this poor j- old Japanese woman with her daughter that was like clearly struggling trying to get the bags to go on the wait thing and he was just watching her like somebody in line had to come forward and help her lift it like he just he didn't care people started yelling because it was taking so long like it this lady came out from the back trying to do damage control like it was the lack of urgency like i know you're on island time near you know you're vibing or whatever but that that airport was crazy all the all the restaurants and like the just you know random convenience stores and stuff closed at 9 p.m 
Like, I didn't know if I was in Honolulu or like Peoria, Illinois, or like or Fresno, where everything just closes at nine. Like Burger King closed at nine o'clock. Like it was, it was the least uh, rushed experience I've ever seen. What airline did you fly? Out of United, but it was at the Honolulu airport. It was the base, you know, yeah. entrance. You know? I don't know, like, because my airport experience was great. So, like, first what, of all, was it at nine like, at night? No. Well, that's different. Like, don't, don't fly at nine at night. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but like, I don't know. It was great. And then they had this cultural gardens there as well. So I got to sit next to a duck, um, which was which was awesome. Yeah, I got a like, picture from this. Like, there's a whole garden in the airport. And like there is um there is geckos, there was birds, there was ducks, there was like the biggest koi fish that I've ever seen. Like that was it was incredible. And they had this whole garden in the middle of the airport. You can just well, like sit outside of the garden. Been, you must have been another terminal because uh mine was a ghost town with nobody working and every yeah. every door closed down at nine o'clock. All right. Well, we should make a podcast sometime talking about horror travel experiences. <laughs> but we actually got a world championships that we gotta be talking about. So Going into this, um, neither of us got to cast last year's world championships, though we did get to be there. So how is it then for you actually being able to work the event? Because it is a very, very, like, I mean, I guess you did work last year, but like being able to be like on the stage, because it's very different experience depending on what you get to do at the world championships. Yeah, for sure. It's so like, yes, I worked production last year. I was the uh, SME for, for Yokohama. So I was still fortunate enough to go and experience it. Uh, but it is totally different than being on that stage. Everybody's watching you. Your job is to tell the story of that match. It's a whole different world than working uh, production. And uh, it's hard It's hard to put into words because, like, this is a position that not only so many people at home value and want themselves to be in, but also your peers also want to be in the position that you are, right? So you have to, like, appreciate that we were one of the six and a half because you know scott was only doing like one game a day so <laughs> or scott. Uh, yeah and that was planned before that was guys planned. just that was so you job, guys don't yes. think like scott yeah, yeah, yeah. was like a sift out like that was, wanted, that was the deal going into it they wanted to, i was like this floater in the ra- in the lounge and maybe cost like one match a day or whatever that was the plan yeah so it's a really important position to be in that your your people your viewers and your peers also kind of wish they were in because i'll be honest i was jealous last year that i wasn't working worlds i'm not going to sit here and say oh it's no big deal uh we'll get them next year like no i was bummed out so i imagine that's how other people feel so i really am fortunate and really happy that you and i were able to uh be back and honestly i had fun our match we did together uh but my you know my main partner gabby i think her and i like crushed it all weekend honestly i'm very proud of uh Especially because the lack of prep we were able to do, which is my fault since I was at the Olympics, uh, with our lack, considering our lap, lack of prep, I'm very proud of how Gabby and I did all weekend. You should be. I think like everyone involved should be. I feel like like the level overall, the work we've been putting in, and kind of like the level of accountability everyone's been holding each other to. Like coming out of the weekend, like there's always stuff that it's like man, this could have been better. I I could have said this better. I could have casted this better. But that's such a normal part of casting. If you come out of something thinking it was absolutely perfect, you're probably delusional, honestly. But you can be proud of the work that you put in. And like across the board, I'm proud of everyone because I think um, everyone worked really hard to have a good show. And I think that really did get to show during the weekend. Yeah, I honestly, like from the start on Friday with the, uh, like with the opening round, like with Shohei's match and then, like even with flexing around, like we didn't we didn't really get into our pairs until Saturday. But like Friday, I think this this day one of Worlds might have been even more fun. I don't know your thoughts on comparing it to London, but like I feel like this day one was really fun compared to compared to London, where London was still great. But like I thought, just the vibes and the energy of like all the best players weren't just watching the stream, right? Like all the best players that had day two buys in London were were actively playing on day one. So we got access to so many more matches we would not have had if we were under the old system. It was definitely changed how we approached matchups, which it was really cool that we got to see. Obviously, like day one with the day one buys is still impactful, but being able to be like, okay, well, right off the bat, here's let's pull last year world champion or all this, I think was really, really cool. I think for me, comparing it to London, my biggest thing is like the level of, and I don't know if you could share this, but the level of confidence going into it as well. Because London, 
Um, both of us were decently fresh to being picked up by Pokemon. Um, I know that you had like more casting experience than I did. Um, but then we both joined in for the official ranks for Players Cup. And then there wasn't too many IRL events before all of a sudden NASC and then all of a sudden Worlds. So it was a really cool World Championships to be a part of. And like the, hey, this is our first World Championships. But I feel for myself, I was still so green to it that I was more nervous than anything. Like I, I was excited to be there. I was so honored to be there, but I was nervous. Whereas this year, anytime somebody asked me if I was nervous, it's like, oh, heck no, I have caps to the world championships. Like I've worked my butt off to be here. Like I, we have such a talented crew and to be picked for this opportunity. Like I am only happy about it. And I'm going to go up there on that stage and I'm going to bring all that excited like, heck yeah, I'm here type of energy. And I think because of that, like, even the day one when we're rotating stuff out, like, I, I can get stressed and, like, we're rotating partners. But I wasn't stressed. I'm like, you know, I've worked with all these people. I feel great casting with any of these people. This rocks. We get into our partners day two. Me and Leah put in this work. This rocks. And, like, Championship Sunday, like, it was just every single part of it was great. And I think that really makes a big difference. Like, everyone on the team, like, for VG, like, we all get along so well. And being there just, like, casting with your friends for a game that you love and like that you've worked so hard for like i don't know every part of it was just like fantastic in comparison to like what london was even though london will always have like a special place in my heart yeah i think the the casting with friends part is is really important because like as i was casting with gabby i think it was like at one point it hit me on saturday that like like i've known gabby for i think eight years <laughs> at this point you know we've been working through grassroots and official events for I want to say it's either seven or eight years. I can't remember counting off the top of my head. So like, that's a lot of history, right? I'm 31 yeah. years. I'm 31 years old. That's like close to. It's not a third of my life, but it's close to it. You know, the longer we yeah. know each other, the more percentage of our life will you know be connected. But like, it was kind of cool that I also wasn't like stress worried because I was also happy to be there um knowing that like we kind of deserve to be there you know what i mean the amount of work that we put in on the grind uh on commentary trying to improve and trying to entertain the audience like it wasn't like it wasn't the way that london was like trying to prove my worth to show pikachu that i just that i deserved a chance to be on the world stage like i felt like i just straight up deserved to be there off of you know the the work that we have put in and also i will technically say i did join the team in collinsville before covid so sorry we didn't, we didn't both join in the players go we want to be technical uh, i don't know but, anything that happened vgn before players I, I was I'm a just, tcg person that's foreign stuff to me no, i know no, my I'm world just, champions I'm just and to, that's <laughs> i'm just yeah, trying no. to be technical out there you're, for the you're audience fact yeah, yeah i'm fact checking um you're, but I one of the things that Gabby and I were very, you know, honed in on like this weekend, like I talked with her, I was like, listen, Gabs, because I call her Gabsma from Guzma. It's an old story, don't worry about it. Um so I call her, I was like, listen, Gabsma. Uh I didn't actually say it to her, but <laughs> in text I say, it. I don't say it out loud. Anyway, let me get the story out. I was like, our job is to make sure that the audience every three games thinks that they're watching the best game every three games that the, like the other casters are jealous that they're not casting all around that we're cast around three instead of around one. And then we're on this thread. Like that was my perspective going. It was like, we want to make it so that everybody has as positive of a time as possible every three rounds, because I can't control what's going on in Lou, in Lou and Rose's match or Sierra and Lee's match, but we can control our energy. We can control our entertainment and our, you know, communication. And I think it worked out. That's always like, cause looking back at it, like I definitely wanted to make sure that the energy going into it, that you could properly explain the stakes and deliver on them. Right. So looking at the later two, like the later day two matches, um, because me and Lee actually got to cast Luca's top eight and top four. And I think that we did, I haven't gone back and reviewed yet, but coming off of that, I feel like we did a really good job kind of like hero building through the story for which one was going to be taking it down. Like we're looking at like the leads kind of stating the importance before going into it. Like, you know, somebody can win off of these leads right here, right now. It's like, who wants to go for like this big play? Who wants to go for that? Kind of hyping up like the different moves and stuff. And in a way that when the players did switch things up, that it was super, super rewarding. And 
really got to like deliver on that hype and i think it was just like man like like i, I don't know about y'all but like me and lee got some absolutely amazing matches like oh, it was yeah. just we got some bangers yeah like it was just across the board we had such good matches that it wasn't hard to go into a match being like i want to make sure to li- deliver on energy level because it was so hype how could you not right, right. like the players were matching it yeah yeah, or, like, even just, like, the drama of the situation, like, this was such a heartbreaking moment, but at the same time, like, this is VGC, but in the senior finals, um, game, turn one of game three, Draco Meteor miss. So all of a sudden, it's, like, this, like, potentially game-defining moment, right? Like, it was a three-game set that was so drastically back and forth, and then all of a sudden, like, this happened. Like, it was just, I don't know, every part of it was just, like... This whole weekend, like, all the matches, like, it was so good. So good. Yeah, you should always reflect at the end of a broadcast and things you can improve on, things that could have went better, but also being happy with the performance you did give. And, like, you know, selfishly, I talked with Abby, I think we had the match of the weekend of Sheila Yang Tang's winning in on day two. Like, from the, the Twitter conversations and the people that I had multiple friends messaging me after that match, like, oh, my God, that was that was an incredible match. Like, I... I feel like a winner, you know, even though uh, even though I wasn't actually playing. No, honestly. And, like, that's such a great, like, feeling to have coming out of the matches as well. Because it's like, yeah, I look back at all of the matches. And I think the the most unclose match me and Lee had was Sage Park versus Aaron's Hypertron Zay. <laughs> yeah. Which was just hype in itself. Because Sage yeah. brought the Pachirisu. And then you have Aaron's Redemption. And that was the most, like, one-sided match we got. But it was still so hype like that one was so much fun because me and lee like going into round two we were like because i i said it on broadcast but my first introduction which i know i'm not alone into this my first introduction in vgc was watching seijun's patcherisu run on youtube it was years after the fact but that was my first impression of vgc and it was like wow this is so cool not even because of the patcherisu it was the crowd every time the patcherisu hit the field yeah and everyone's losing it absolutely losing their minds and the commentators are losing it like every part of it was just so hype so then we saw seijin just running back the pachirisu at the 10th anniversary we're like yo if seijin like because picking matchups can be so hard we're like yo if seijin plays against somebody even like you know a little no like we got we got to pull this match and we're like we're both like we're so committed to looking at who he's playing against like we want to pull him we pull up the pairings cj park versus Aaron day we're like do we even look we did look through the rest of the matchups just in case because if it was like a wolf versus edu situation like we gotta pull that you know what i mean yeah. but we're like like do we even have to look through the matches like this is amazing we did look through and of course this is the best matchup but that was still like if that is your most unclosed match and it's still just such a banger it was just it was just a great time like i am and so like that was how I got to kick off the world championships. Like what? And yeah, I was so jealous that you guys got the Seijun match because, like, I also yeah. the my introduction to competitive Pokemon was exactly ten years ago watching Patrisu live right on on yeah. Twitch. So, like, it yes, it was gimmicky, sure, but it also had value. It had merit, right? It was yeah. Terra Fairy Volt Absorb. All the instant Mariah on counter. Marino's no more electric and dragon attacks. Like you're almost yeah. you have Dazzling, which is really not gonna hit you that hard. So like there is understandable value. I just mm-hmm. I think maybe Seijun, maybe he brought the pat the patchy against Aaron when he didn't necessarily need to. Is it for the bit? Is it for the crowd? Is it whatever? Regardless, we appreciate it. But he went he had a winning in into round eight. He was uh he was five and two going into round eight and lost his winning in so like it's not like the the pokemon was that much of a detriment i'm sure he i'm sure he found value out of it like would he have done better if it if it was a better supportive pokemon may say an ogre pond or an amoongus maybe but he he wore the exact same clothes he wore 10 years ago like there was he was committed to the appreciation the history of the game and like you gotta give him credit for it and it's also when you look at it because yeah it's like it maybe was like it's hard to say without actually having talked to him about it but maybe it was brought a little bit for the nostalgia but like you said it wasn't actually the worst pick going into this and that's where those picks can kind of just be dictated a little bit by the arcanine roulette because like if Sajin went up against maride on 808 rounds yeah that's an easy 80 into day two right 
but like his matchup against Aaron was a little bit of like it was a tough matchup. Um, and you just hit a couple of those, especially when we're not in too centralized of a meta, but it's actually pretty like even when you have it restricted, like the other five would be quite different. And we're right on being at the number two spot after Ice Rider, I believe, or like very close third. It was third, yeah. Count- yeah, you counter a Pokemon that is unfortunately in the third place, and there is a lot of Maridons, but, you know, so that's where it kind of gets a little bit tough. But it definitely wasn't, like, the worst call into it, which was just just very hype. It was very hype. Like, there, there is a world where, I mean, you know, I think we had, of every stream match, I think Maridon was more often than not on one of the two teams on stream. Like, sure, it might have been only 18% of the field, but the players that were progressing through the tournaments and so the players that made the better, you know, meta team building decisions were using Maridon. Our world champion used Maridon, right? Like, so many people were at the top tables were using the third most used restricted, but you can't, you can't come, even if, even if Luca lost the finals to Ice Rider, like, Marino was still the star of of Honolulu by far, but, but just yeah. because of the sheer t- amount of times it was focused and and showcased throughout the weekend. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So, talking a little bit more about the World Championships before we get too far into like the nitty gritty meta stuff. I know there's people asking questions in the um, Discord as well, so I figured while we're still on the broadcast aspect of talking about things, we would kind of answer a couple of these so i gotta find um did you um, oh, like your like your swithering question oh the slithering question um <laughs> yeah because this one this one's an easy answer um i did manage manage to find a slithering before championship sunday y'all so Alyssa, one of the judges a wonderful person um she i saw her carrying a slithering around and like a heart is on her back on the saturday and i'm like oh my god Alyssa, please let me seal that for championship sunday i need a slithering with me and she's like, 100%. And so she delivers me the Slytherwing the next day. And she's like, look, he has little flowers. She had little flowers like on the <laughs> Slytherwing. It was perfect. I don't think you can see him on the desk, but I did have him on the desk with during the finals cast. And then when I was on the lounge, I had the little Slytherwing and it was just like absolutely perfect. Um, so yeah, um, another question that has a, one we can both answer. Jay Valley, what does it mean to be a part of the world championship and see the growth of the game? And being a part of the history of the world championships. That's a heavy question. There's a lot of different directions yeah. you can uh you can go with it. So it's a good question from Jay Valley. I think I this position in particular of, of VGC or a Pokemon broadcaster had the importance has never been lost on me because I understand when I first started and when I was watching and the inspiration I had, like I always say, I went to Boston the Boston World Championships and I met Shady Penguin, I met Jay Witz, and I met Puka, and I met, you know, all these, you know, great people. Um, and watching the Machampion moment in seniors, and then watching the finals, and seeing the crowd, and hearing the casters, and, you know, how great everyone was, that was my inspiration. I was like, I want to be on that stage. That was my moment that, like, the slip before I was just a player for a year and a half, I was just playing the game, watching streams, and enjoying competitive BGC, but that that see the end of uh 2015 onward was when i made the switch to uh, trying to become a full-time caster because i wanted to have those experiences that the casters you know shady and scott and you know dwee and everybody else were were having and i wanted to share those with the community right i wanted to be a part of a uh a Pachirisu level uh <laughs> level of match that i was able to commentate and who knows maybe one day uh, one of my one of my matches that I've casted can be a Pokemon Championship history, you know, match or or between rounds content. So I've always respected and appreciated the value that we as casters bring to the World Championship. So uh, both with London and with this year, like it's uh, something like I saw every time I went on that stage, I appreciated like. I have to do this for myself, one, because it's my job, and I want to I want to perform my job well. But I also have to do this for the people that help me get here along the way and for the audience that has high expectations of us performing well yeah i feel like you said a lot of that really well i think it's what's really cool and interesting about our position because i've been asked before if i got to compete or to cast at worlds which one i'd pick and i think i'd pick casting every single time because you're in a really unique position where you get to tell the player's story for them and that's a lot of responsibility to have i'm thinking of like the great calls and the great moments that 
I've gotten to hear, not just in VGC, but in other games. And you are writing the story for the player who can't in that moment. They're playing the game, they're doing the action, but the narrative that you bring to it will forever shape what they get to do in the game, which I think is so cool. And it's a lot of responsibility and to be trusted with something like that, I think is absolutely amazing as well as like, that means a lot to me, honestly, like it really pushes me, inspires me to do better by everyone. Right. As well. Um, oh, what was I going to say? I like, got like totally like lost myself, like for that <laughs> one. Um, oh, I forgot the next part of what I was going to say. Wow. I was on a cooker okay. for half a second. We'll go back to the, co- go back to the co- You were cooking. You were cooking. So I was cooking. I was cooking. Um, go back wow. to being more and seeing the growth of the game and being a part of the history of the world championships. Was it something about the growth of the game or? What were you? What were you cooking? Oh my god! I totally. We're both jet lagged still, guys. Yeah, so bit, like, I'm like, I'll take a sip of my cool lime refresher. Wow, what could it have been? There you go. I'll I'll fill in for you. Like the you know all, from from the beginning and of all time, Evan has always been my favorite commentator. Right. Um, I don't think I necessarily picked up any of his traits. Like, I think if you watch an Evan Evan casting out NAIC this year finals versus me casting it the year prior i don't think we're similar i think i'm probably more similar to the the shady penguin and uh justin flynn school of commentary but evan has always been my favorite for his ability to tell the stories and his ability to control the match right they control the conversation and the narrative of the match and like how many times we had scott remember we had scott on oko just a couple weeks ago talking about like here you are 10 years later and like your voice is connected to the Seijun match. Like yeah. Evan Latt saying Seijun Park where's the like is 10 years later still iconic and significant. Like and Scott was saying like he really understands that in the moment he didn't appreciate it but now he wishes he could go back and like appreciate the moment a little bit more that he was being a part of history as it was being written, you know? So I think that's something we always have the opportunity, whether it's a, whether it's round two at a, at a regional or something like, remember the dragon Knight comeback comeback was round three at NAIC. It wasn't significant. It was day one, nothing crazy. And it's arguably like the most significant moment at, besides Pachirisu that our game, our game has had. So like take that perspective, whether it's world's finals or round four of the you know Baltimore regionals, like put, put your best foot forward because it could end up being important. Yeah, I remembered it, by the way. Okay, there you go. I wrote I it down, so I wouldn't. I was trying I know, to help I appreciate you. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you got to elaborate a little bit more, too. Um, So that it worked out, because I don't know if we would have gotten that answer from you if I wasn't um yeah, yeah. a little silly. Um, But no, um, I, I got confused with myself here, because you're talking about, like, the history of the game and thinking back. My history of this game is very different. It's a lot shorter of a history than anyone on our casting team. Um, But where, like that seeing that growth of the game is hopping into the game while a lot of other people were, and then being able to, through my commentary, help other people get into the game too. Cause even when I didn't understand the game, even when I look back at like Seijin's match, like other matches, I didn't understand what was going on, but it was the commentary and the hype and like how passionate others were about telling me about this moment. That made me excited for that. And that's something that I always want to do with my own commentary is that like, even if you do not understand VGC, I want to tell you what's important and why and help you understand. And I think like, there was even some comments over a couple matches that I got of, yeah, like, I don't know what's going on, but like Sierra has me like cooked right now. Like, I I don't really know. And like, that is like the highest compliment because that's what I want. I want to tell you that like, this is, this is crazy right now. This is crazy. And I want to deliver on that hype and like you to understand so that anyone, whether they're a seasoned player, brand new to the game, TCG player that just happens to be watching. And it's like, you know what? It's kind of cool. Like I want to bring other people into the game the same way that I kind of got brought into it. So that kind of, that's something that being a part of the history of the world championships where people are there that might be their first time and everything. I think that is very cool. Cause that's, something you can accomplish on literally like the biggest stage like it is such an honor to be trusted with that so yeah well even with the like the growth aspect of of the question like well, it was funny you know, our our good friend chris schnabel was he was texting me the whole time he was watching he's you know he's five hours ahead of honolulu and he was staying up late to watch and like 
from the start of Friday, I was like, hey, can you, I literally texted him, I was like, hey, can you take a screenshot of me and Gabby at some point, just like, like, post it online, and he, like, you know, tried a uh, bunch of screenshots, and that started day one, and then he watched the entire weekend, he watched all of VGC, he started watching on Championship Sunday, he started with Go, watched all of TGT, watched VGC, and, like, he was like, I don't know what's going on, I think you're doing great, you know, well, it's a, like, and that was, a, that was Friday. And the, the text message I got during Junior's finals Sunday was like, I don't know if he should have set up Trick Room in that spot. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> to see the amount of growth that he uh, uh, had gotten from as a as a viewer from start of Friday to Sunday from watching the whole stream was like, all right, we're doing a good job, right? We're explaining yeah. these basic interactions and mechanics to the layman person there. And then what was really cool is one of my other uh, one of my fraternity brothers actually texted me. And because he saw I posted, you know, the, uh, that I was working, they all know I do Pokemon and stuff. And he was like, bro, 86,000 people were watching you as you did that match. Like, I'm so proud of you, blah, blah, blah. Aww. And I never look at the, you know, the view count, you know, and like we're on the broadcast, like we're, I don't really have my phone out or anything. And like, not only is that cool, like I didn't know that many people were watching, but like back, we're talking about the growth. We used to be at Worlds 10,000, 12,000. 18,000 people watching Masters Finals, right? Like, and so for 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 Championship Sunday to be up near like 80, 86,000 people at watching uh, just on, you know, one form. I don't know if it was Twitch or YouTube what he was watching on, but like that's that's really cool that that many people got to get to see us do this. I didn't realize like that many people were watching, honestly. Like that is like I remember being nervous for like broadcasts with significantly less people. And the thing that we were like casting in front of that many people is just. I get I more know. excited it's when nice. there's more people. Cause it seems not that it's more worth it. Right. Cause every, every event is, is worth it. You gotta put your best foot yeah. forward, but it's like, it's a bigger, it's a bigger deal. Like I used to get hyped when we would have Liberty garden uh, locals that would get raided. Like I remember once we had a local because we were the first people uh, with vgc 2016 we were the first ever event in like january 2nd or whatever in brooklyn and some japanese stream raided us with over 2,000 people and i i was like everyone was oh my god this is so crazy but i was like lock in like that's cool we have two th <laughs> usually we got 200 people watching us. we got 2,000 watching us let's convert some people to you know normal view like so when the the numbers get higher like i i get more excited for it. i i used to be nervous but like now it's now it's not i think like it goes back to like I know I've like worked for it and like there's always more you can do, but I don't feel too nervous. Though I am like, ugh, I did mess up one mechanic pretty bad. Oh um, no! Did you, you not see that? A do you mechanic? see my? Do you see? Do you see my? Well, so for everyone listening, there is no audio backstage. So when you're not casting, we oh. have no idea oh. what the other casters are saying. Oh my god, this one, oh, it was so bad. And, like, the others that, like, did listen in, they were like, okay, like, it wasn't as bad as you think it was, but I dare not, like, go back and watch that match. And apparently it must not be as bad as I thought it was, because I haven't seen a single YouTube comment yet, like, calling me out for being dumb, right? And, like, people love to, people, <laughs> like, love to, yeah. People, like, if you people messed stand up, in line to do that. Yeah. yeah, like, people are very quick to tell you you've messed up. But, um, <laughs> I tweeted out, just like Don Dozo, I am unaware. With a picture uh, of me just looking like backstage. Oh, was this the Draco still doing full damage after yes. the drop? Which yeah. is also the silliest. Like, yeah. It's not even like, oh, so like, you can find people. Like, there's a million things going on in the game, and you're so focused on casting. And before we get into a game, especially if there's certain mechanics or anything, I always refresh my memory. I will, like, any ability that I'm, like, not 100% certain on, like, that I'm willing to call out in front of 86,000 people. I double check. Going into that match, that was not the match that me and Lee were originally going to do. That was our first top eight match. We were originally going to have the um, the um, Michael DeRest match, mm -hmm. but then that one ended up taking longer. So then we did our, the other top eight match, which was uh, Luca's match. So because it pivoted right before we went live, I didn't get a chance to do my little refresher. And I always mix up unaware and oblivious and so i was already in my head i'm already in my head i'm like oh man i hate i hate these two abilities i hate don dozo at my very first scarlet and violet event i messed up unaware in a really bad way that actually still haunts me that was like tragic um and then 
I, for some reason, had like gaslit myself into thinking that unaware only ignored positive changes, not negative ones, which is then where I said that, you know, we are going to do less. And then Lee corrected me and I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm actually going to die right here, right now on the stage. I am Recipes. done. I am cooked. It's over. I could not believe for as much work as I put in playing this game and studying, because you know that like I, I do work my butt off. And I was like to mess up at my very first event for stupid unaware Don Dozo. And then to do it again at the world championships. Are you kidding me? Are you absolutely kidding me? That's so, a, yeah, I was. That's the Dozo Bozo for you. Yeah, I was mortified. I normally like to go back in Twitch comments, too. I couldn't bear to do that for that match. Absolutely not. I was like, you know what? I know I screwed up. I, I, I do not. And, like, Lee and, like, the others were telling me it wasn't that bad, but I was just like, oh, my God, I feel bad. Like, I am mortified still. I cannot believe that. Like, I will never make that mistake again, but I'm still... I mean, I guess I said that after Orlando. So, like, I don't know, but... <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't it's know. It's always... Uh... Whenever Dundozo's relevant, it's always, it's gonna, you know. And it's even more relevant to the new format. Oh my god, Uh, tell me about it. Man, so yeah, that was, um, that was the one, um, that was the one low of the weekend. So, this one wasn't asked as a question, but I'll ask you too, if you had a low of the weekend. Ooh. Since, um, I'm chatting about mine. So yeah, yeah, that was an easy low. That was an easy low for me. I like I sat in the green room after that and Lee kept trying to like come up to me. It's okay. It's okay. And I'm like, no, I'm so upset. No, I'm so upset. I can't do believe I just did that. Like I, it was like a solid like 20 minutes. So like being in my head and just being like, oh, my God, I'm going to die before I, I finally like got over it. But wow. I'm trying to think of my low of the week. I'm trying like I don't think I got mechanics or interactions wrong i know i messed up one of the games i messed up my sentence the way i wanted to present the information there was a choice specs chi Yu that scarf or shifu was faster than and what i was trying to say was that like oh this chi is in danger one because you can't one you can't protect anyway in front of her shifu and this her shifu is faster than it so it's like it's doubly in trouble but like I kind of said, like, I, I forget, I said something like, oh, the Chi Yu can't uh, protect because the Ur Shifu scarf is like, well, it's only choice backs anyway, so obviously it can't protect. Blah, blah, blah. So, like, I messed up that. And then, um, uh, I like, my other low, like, could it just be a consistent low of, like, the amount of sweat the whole time? Like, yeah. could that count as a your low? Your low because, is your low, right? Because, so, for anyone who doesn't know, Sometimes commentary and, and commentators in general, they like to stand while doing commentary. I've never been this type of guy, but it helps your diaphragm or yada, 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 all the pros and cons. I don't know. I hear it all the time from the other casters. So I guess at Worlds, we all just decided we're going to stand. And so when you're standing, it takes more effort and you're also closer to the lights up top. So every time we were sitting in the chairs, I was cool as a cucumber. I'm just used to normal, you know, commentary. But when we're standing for 47 minutes straight and I'm right next to the the, the lights and I was sweating like crazy every single round. I was like texting the Discord, like asking like our production team, like, please, like, you know, sweat rag, like f- uh, fan, just like anything to, to help me. And like, I would always like sit there after my cast was done and just like, vigorously wipe off my headset because i felt bad for whatever caster had to go had to use that headset next whoever was next yeah i was i was sweating a lot and it does get hot you also didn't need to stand like i i'm personally a stander like you'd look dumb if i'm sitting and you're standing we need solidarity no i think it's i think it's fine because the cameras aren't on us like during cast like my thing is like for me i get more hype like I'm glad the cameras aren't on us because I am constantly like moving. Like I am like, I'm like tapping the desk and like, not the, I want the pass, but I'm just like, Oh my goodness. Or like I'm bouncing up and down or like jumping or anything. Like I'm constantly moving. So I feel like, like that energy like helps me while casting and I just get so much more like excited and then I can showcase it and like doing that pumps me up. So it just like, it all kind of funnels into like a better, more excitable cast for yeah. me. So I understand but the you value. Don't, you I don't just, have to. Yeah, I don't want. Don't I don't want to sweat. You know. Yeah, but you don't have to sit if you don't want to. Like, like especially too. Like, it helps me, to... but if it doesn't help you, 
Yeah, like going in, I can see the value in standing while talking, but like going into Sunday, like I was there all day. I'm like, man, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to rest. I'm going to drink water. I'm just going to sit backstage. You know, I get to the stage and me and Gabby there. I'm like, I'm feeling good. I haven't sweat all day. Like, you know, I'm in the spot. We come in from the break and I'm doing all, you know, all our normal shenanigans. I'm like, oh, all right. The, my, my profusely sweating days are behind us. Like, I'm ready. This is junior finals, baby. And then we stand up and like, of course, the game one was 18 and a half minutes long, and I'm just all over. And I was like, I, I got a little cocky. I got a little cocky. And then I, uh, I started, I had, to, had to text our uh, production team for, for help. I thought I could make it through junior finals without being a sweaty mess. Turns out not the case. I said, you got to do what's best for you. Like, I, like I, I wouldn't, I would always stand, even if my co cast are sitting, but I never, like, why you said it you know what i mean yeah but i can definitely understand if one person is like the other might but uh that was that was my question but while we're talking about like the low lights and stuff um split had this question um what was your favorite moment of world so i, I want to do a two-parter here i want to do like your favorite call that you made for the broadcast stuff as well just like your generic like overall favorite moment okay calls i might have to go back on i know i almost had the perfect call in top four when um uh what was i hold on i have we'll get to the results uh, stuff in a bit when, guys we're just like nerding out a broke yeah, broadcast yeah. When stuff. I had, we'll get so to the results. gabby and i were on U- uses match right and we already knew luca was in the finals and so <laughs> in my head like i was right there i was like i'm gonna set this up i'm gonna be perfect and i was like it's japan Verse Italy, Universe Luca, like I and I wanted to say Maridon versus Ice Rider tomorrow on Championship Sunday. I had this whole thing playing in my head. All I said was Japan versus Italy. Like I messed up the whole thing, and that happens a lot on commentary. For those who don't know, who haven't done commentary, a lot of times if you try to pre-plan lines, they kind of get butchered in your head because you put so much weight behind it. So a lot of times it's better to have stuff come off the cuff. Um, the because it kind of sounds more natural because it literally is more natural. You're not trying to pre pre plan it. I think my best call of the weekend was Jerry Shiliang Tang's winning in match with his ogre pond teal mask. And I said I can't remember the exact way I ended it, but I was like from Kitakami to Honolulu, Ogre Pond says blah blah blah. And I thought that was a great call to the DLC. If it was a great call to specifically Teal Mask, because that's the one shown in the storyline of the Kitakami DLC. Like, so I think that was probably my my favorite reference I made all weekend. That's a good one. I uh, see. I am very much so like a line prepper. Um, whether I use them or not, I don't know. But like, you know this for like LAIC, yeah. I had a line like planned out, whether it was Marco or Tiago winning, because it was like I want to yeah. get like the history of the moment too. Like, I don't know. I. I I popped off with the LAIC once. Both of those were so well around. I was I was proud of that. But I definitely get like the natural part of it. Um and then do you have like a favorite like generic like worlds moment or not call related? Ooh. Um I don't know, because honestly I really didn't go outside but like, I didn't go out into the venue too often. I did like the only time I went out I was watching Paul Chua and Edu's match on um on day one i want to say um but i didn't really leave the venue too much i guess it was cool when i was watching you and lee in seniors finals i was hanging out with jody and marisa just out in the crowd uh and as like i could not play pokemon go all weekend backstage it was a nightmare the the gps was garbage like i kept thinking i was in new orleans when i wasn't even in new orleans in june so i don't know why i thought i was there you're not the only one don't worry um so i was very frustrated because i love playing go at worlds and doing the raids and stuff so i finally seniors finals i finally get to work in that exact one spot where jody and marisa are and i do one raid the whole weekend and it was a shiny chrysalia so i guess that was my that's my high of the weekend that's not uh casting related that's a good one that's a good one um for high like overall like i really just enjoyed this world like i I cannot understate how amazing it is to like be at a world championships casting like and working with your friends, right? Like it's there's no stress backstage. It's only love, it's only support and that was awesome. Um so watching the closing ceremonies, it was me, Gabby, um Rose and Lou on the stage. Um 
watching like the closing stuff and i always get like emotional at the end of this like sort of stuff like always so um they were doing like the world's like closeout video with the song banger song by the way i was like tearing up i'm like i'm on this like i'm on the world's like the casting desk stage with like with my girls because it was also just really really cool that there was like four women casting the world championships and like for Pokemon, it never feels like a diversity thing. It feels like a, we all earned this. So it was really cool to just be like, wow, like the four of us are sitting here watching this together after kicking butt all weekend. Like, let's go. Like, that was just a really, really cool moment. Um, so there was that. Um, there was also, um, wow, my memory is just like completely like this. this what was your um, favorite call that you had? No, there was another. Oh, watching the um, no, the the call. But um, another cool moment was like watching the drone show out by the water when we all um went and got mm-hmm. the food. Um, um, me and Gabby just like sat like on the dock, like just like watching the show, and it was just like very. Cool. But, uh, you um, mean when you were uh, offering me food, and I thought you were taking garbage, so I threw my garbage onto yeah, your plate. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I um, <laughs> I. <laughs> I normally don't eat like for especially like oh. the Hawaii. Like I like pineapple, all right, but everyone else likes pineapple way more than I do. I so love whenever, pineapple. so whenever I had a pineapple slice with anything, I offered it to somebody else. Your brown sitting there eating an acai bowl out of pineapple. It was and awesome. I, so he was the last one that I offered my slice of pineapple to. So I was just like showing my plate around to who wants the pineapple, and then I show it to Joe Brown as he's like finished his food. So he takes his acai bowl and just puts it on my plate. Like I'm taking his garbage. And I just like table. I just like sat there and everyone's laughing at him. And like a German has no clue what's going on. Because this is why he thinks I'm just taking his garbage. (laughs) And like, yeah, it was that was that was also pretty funny. But like we all went out like it was just like cool, right? So yeah. Um favorite call. Um, two of them. So First one isn't necessarily a favorite call, more so it was just kind of like um I'm proud of like my knowledge of a po- as a Pokemon player. Um because you know more than anyone that it's there's a lot of pressure on you to be delivering like the proper analysis in the games and stuff can get missed so easily. Yep. You're up there casting in front of people, you're trying to deliver all these words in the stories and it's so much easier um to be sitting at home spectating and knowing what's going on. And that even goes for the players. You've seen players like throw before because it's so much easier when you're not in that moment. Um, So sometimes things get missed and sometimes it reflects poorly. But there was one match that me and Lee were doing where the Amoongus ended up getting T-waved. And we were kind of setting up the scenario, hey, if the Amoongus gets paralyzed on a turn and goes for Rage Powder, um, they can actually double into the other slot and it's cooked. So we set it up and... Next turn, as we're in Trick Room, by the way, um, the Amoongus gets paralyzed. So then all of a sudden we're freaking out, freaking out. Um, But then something else protects, and then the Amoongus' partner Pokemon protects. And then instantly I cut in, and I was like, all right, it's actually all good. It wasn't a Rage Powder. It was an attempt at a double protect, and it went into the other slot. So this is like a no harm, no foul type of turn. But a little bit of precursor of what's to come. So now you might have to be a little on edge because you know that this is a scenario. But it was catching really fast in the moment because it doesn't tell you what move it tried to go for. It just said it was paralyzed. Right. And Rage Powder would have been the first thing to go off, but so would Protect in a Trick Room Amoongus. So calling that instantly, and I was like, I had confidence in calling out what I saw, which I sometimes don't always do. And I was proud. I even had a friend like message me after and just be like, Really good call on catching this because it would it can it changes the narrative right so I'm proud of that um on an actual like casting call um the setting up the foul play Terra Dark Frigograph into yeah. the Calyrex Shadow Rider because first off um not doing the exact stats that they had um if you do standard sets it's not an Oko but obviously if you don't have something at a zero attack IV. Or if the figure out, uh, like, depending on how it's trained, it could be different, right? So, in the ideal perfect scenario, not an Oko. But, um, it all of a sudden Oko's, and we freak out. And it was a rightfully, just so, like, rightfully so freak out. And then it happens again in game three. And knowing that that was the turn that was going to be set up, started, like, and this was senior finals, senior finals. I start hyping it up beforehand, like, 
last time it KO'd, this is what we need to see, this is, like, the thing, and, like, kind of, like, really put everything onto that moment to set it up for either which way, whether it O-Code or didn't. And I was just, like, really proud of, like, how it all kind of came together for a very game-defining moment. Because even though there was the Draco Meteor miss on that turn one, the one-hit KO from the foul play for Regarap opened the door to where it was a winnable match, depending on the four brought. So it was, like, actually a huge call. And, like, it was, I thought I delivered it, like, okay. So I was very just, like, proud of that on, like, a Brad Fast end. So, you know. No, I, little, I remember those, 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 those foul the, plays. They were, they were big That was crazy. That yeah. was actually crazy. So, yeah. Um, what do you think about what do you think about the most important match of the weekend, Sierra? And that was was it round six or whatever of day of day one the the Oko match the one match we got together. Yeah. yeah so somebody asked like um, favorite moment like the surprise Oko casting around. It wasn't a surprise for us. We did know that we would get to cast you casting rotations get um, picked up beforehand. Um, but that was nice that we got to, we got to like cast around together, like having the day one rotation. I'm always like back and forth on how I feel about the rotation, but considering I got to work with like, um, you, obviously I was just like, I'm all for rotations. That was, that was a lot of fun. That was also just a really cool moment. Like, man, from like us casting together, like for at London, when we were so like pretty green to then missing last year to then like being here casting, like, I don't know, it was cool. Yeah, and also like one shout outs to uh I I kind of ra- I kind of tried to run the idea in with the production team of letting us hit the Oko stinger and I was like, you know, so shout outs to Katie who allows us to do that, right? To have a little yeah. little bit of a self pseudo podcast reference on the official broadcast. Katie's our uh, our broadcast producer for those who don't and know. The goat. Uh but then shout outs to Cameron, our director, because he was already gonna do it before I said anything. Like when I asked, he said, Oh, don't worry, brother, I'm hitting it. So <laughs> like we like it, it, I don't know how to express like this podcast has been around for a year, but the way that like the community is coming together, I got so many people come up to me this weekend talking more about the podcast and commentary and, you know, other things like, and like for me to be like, hit the stinger and the one hit KO comes up and like seeing people's comments, like we're like pseudo recognized by the official broadcast, right? Like that's just such a feeling. I, I can't even describe how awesome a feeling that is. It's really cool. Cause obviously, um, Looking at, like, the casters across the board, our opinions are our own, and, like, we don't do, like, content for Pokemon unless it's actually something they've asked us to do, like, the videos or whatnot. But to see that it's, like, okay, like, we'll recognize this, and that, I don't know, it makes me feel, like, a more a part of kind of, like, the casting stuff and, like, that broadcast yeah. and that whole show thing. That's, like, that's really fun. That's really cool. And it was, like, a treat for the audience. We got to have one Oko <laughs> round together when we weren't, you know, obviously we knew we were supposed to, but, like, from the audience perspective, oh, we got to have Oko when we weren't supposed to, you know? Yeah, and, like, it's it's really cool to see, like, the support as well, like, for just, like, us as casters and then, like, as Oko and stuff, too. Like, I cannot express, like, even, like, one of us will, like, come on stream and it's, like, I see a Slytherin in chat or it's, like, oh, my God, you're proud. And then, like, seeing, like, when we're casting together, like, Oko stuff, it's just, like, I don't know. It's really, really cool. Like, when I look back on weekend outside of broadcasting stuff the fact that we have that community um and people that appreciate that i don't know it's just very it's very yeah. cool so thank also you all, didn't have so. to fill a second of downtime together first time ever yeah right <laughs> right i know whenever i had to fill downtime on day two it was with um lee and scott yeah so and then we um when we were closing out we were being a little silly with the giveaways <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a, that was that was a little fun over a segment that sometimes could not be as fun but he's like oh we're giving away this and i was like lee like surely we can't be giving away more huh he's like <laughs> wow <laughs> like it was just it was goofy it was fun but overall um great great time but um i think too we got to talk about the results and all sure. the bg the good stuff about it um as like we knew that going into this event with regulation g and just like what people would be able to build upon going to this event would work out but it was really fun to see how exactly it did build out and like there was a lot of signs of what was kind of to come i mean obviously like the top three the maridon and the callies were super super strong but how people decided to build around those like parflame had a decently sized like resurgence at the event instant kind of falling down to only 25 percent like it was I know it was quite interesting to see what people are up to. Iron Valiant 
in the in the finals. Uh, like yeah. Iron Valiant was almost world champion. Yeah, it was almost a world champion. Yeah, I think it's crazy. Uh, what was fun? I'm happy I had uh, Ogre Front Hearthflame on my predictions because I had seen one of the prior Victory Road, you know, Road to Honolulu tournaments or or whatever in uh, July. It was when I was at the Olympics. It was actually the day when I went on the uh, the Tub Takes podcast. They were talking about the the tour, the Victory Road tour from the night before. I was like, oh, okay, I'll I'll look it up. And I saw, I was like, man, there's a lot of Hearth Flame here. And then I saw Shohei actually use Hearth Flame in that event. So I'm like, okay, there's there's something real going on. I tried to look at it, and I'm like, I was like, well, the the best thing I can think of is that it resists fairy and resists Marana resists Maradon's electric attacks, as well as like fire ogre pond giving it attack boosts. Like those plus one ivy cudgel crits hit harder than all the other ivy cudgel crits do. So I'm yeah. like, there's something people are. Or do it. So I'm I'm happy I picked up on that in the the world the the lead up to preparation for worlds even when I had such little time to prepare. But like I mean I I laid a fat egg Sierra with my legendary prediction because I pre- I predicted Kyogre to pop off and we didn't even see it on stream once the whole weekend. Yeah, I mean, oh my goodness, I jump scared myself with opening a tab. <laughs> what? <laughs> For anybody who's an audio listener, let me just run let me just run through what happened. I finished talking and Sierra just like kind of casually starts her sentence with her head. Her eyes peel and then she just chucks her headphones off. And, oh, like a, like she saw a goblin or something. So I was trying to open up the Pokemon stream because Victory Road only has day 2 usage and I wanted to see if there was day 1 somewhere and it auto played and I had it on Mac so I could hear oh, you on okay. the podcast. So it auto played right at like a loud music point, and yeah, <laughs> like it. Anyway, I, I fumbled the Kyogre pick. I mean, I told y'all backstage, but like you know, like I, I think it was a silly pick. Two in top eight at NAIC, bro. What do you want from me? Yeah, one was with Overquill because Henry's a madman. <laughs> like, love Henry, but I'm like, I don't look at Kyogre, and I'm like. Yo, that's like a that's a that's a niche type of team that like you've just you're crazy. You're crazy. That isn't yo Kyogre's the best. Like that is a that is a special type of thing. Same how like Wo Chien Kyogre actually did really well at like NASC. Also like Shilin Tang. But like yeah. I'm not looking at and being like Wo Chien's the go. Wo Chien's gonna win the world championships. It's like no, it's a special type of thing. So that's how I felt about Kyogre. So seeing a bunch of people go for Kyogre, I was like, yeah, you know me, what, you want to be and Rose all fumble. Yeah, I was like, you guys want to be cute, you want to be you you want to be cute, you want to be quirky. Like that's that's fine. You're wrong, but like that's fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean the fact that it's like there is one at fourteenth, and that is it for Top Cut. That is it. So yeah. Um, Congrats, I guess. But um, <laughs> Thanks, yeah, you, you did pop off with the Heart Flame pick because I was confused when I saw the caster predictions because you were going on about corner, like cornerstone ogre pond, all the time. Even when me, Scott, Ooh. and Lee were doing like the ogre pond like breakdown, I even called out like something about you and corner po- like cornerstone well, because like, I didn't think it. it would be. I I don't remember what the top graphic was from an ASC off the top of my head, but I didn't think it would be eligible. Because it was essentially every Ice Rider had, you know, for the most part, had Ogre Bond Cornerstone. So I didn't even consider putting it on my predictions because Hearth Flame is the one that went, rose in popularity. Like, before, yeah. you know what I mean? Cornerstone was already popular. So I didn't I didn't want to choose it as my, you know, as my sleeper pick. Uh, that's fair. But, like, yeah, it was kind of cool. I think um, the only repeat Pokemon, if I'm looking at this correctly... Um, between the two teams was the Urshifu. Other than that, the finals was two completely yeah. unique teams, which a lot of appreciation for. And even just looking at the top cut in general, I mean, you have like a Dondozo Tatsu, you got a Torkoal, Gallade, and Didi, um, Guts Ursa. Um, you've got an Entei from Michael Pelsch, yeah. like crazy. You have Reggie Alecki in seventh like it was kind of kind of crazy where things were and once you look down like teams also making a splash over the weekend like this donzo tatsu with galarian wheezing i think it was 
overall, as much as I don't enjoy playing this format as much, I think casting and watching it was a lot of fun. Yeah, there are also uh, 13 or Shifu in the top 16. So I like when you look down on, on on Victory Road, you just keep scrolling and scrolling, and it's just the same Pokemon in the same slot. Um, but yeah, I think like Yuta and, and, and Lucas teams are really interesting because uh, when you look at it, by itself like you can be like okay well it's not very the team building is not it's not simplistic right like luka does like his his fire water grass is like or shifu but then hard flame who's also a grass type but then whimsy guy who's also a grass type it doesn't have a grass attack right um so you're like okay well where's the synergy here that you have two supportive grasses and your fire water grass offensive core that you're like you're used to seeing and then on yuda's end like your uh your your fire water grasses are Shifu, uh, Amoongus, and then Pelipper yet again is another water type, but you don't actually have a, uh, a fire type. Even Kali Ice doesn't turn into a fire type. So you're like, all right, well, Iron Valley is crazy fast. Uh, or Shifu is a very fast Pokemon. Lander is his choice scarf, which is, makes it faster than like everything. But then this is a Trick Room, Kali Ice, Amoongus, you know, bulky Pelipper team at the, at the same time. So like, I think like it just shows the, the level that these world caliber players are on because like i definitely would not have i love trick room i would not have rolled up to worlds with uh with you to six like i would not have come to that same conclusion of like the fastest choice scarf and super booster energy speed iron valiant on my trick room ice rider team i i we can talk a little bit more about lucas team in a minute but since we're talking about you to team, i want to know your opinions on this iron valiant because Obviously, if you make it to the second of the world championships, like, you're just a better player than me. You know what? Like, I'm not, I'm not pretending to be like, yo, I'm smarter than our finalists. But like, looking at this Iron Valiant, I don't vibe with it. <laughs> and when I was watching the finals, I really wasn't vibing. I was sitting with some Pokemon Go players and like, they're asking me questions about the game and I'm taking them through this. And I'm just like, you know what, guys? Um, I really just don't know what this is doing. Like, I missed, like, the team sheet explanation and stuff. I hopped in halfway through game one. And maybe it did get to do something that I didn't really get to see. But what I got to see from game two and game three was spirit breaks into a fire, like, ogre yeah. pond that really didn't get to do much because it was only attacking move. And, of course, there's the follow me, but it's, like, I really didn't get to see the utility of it. Whether it's more so because it was a tough matchup or whatnot, I don't know. But I just... I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't with it. So yeah, I think there's two different ways to look at it. Like, like, w do I think it's good versus like what makes it good? Right? Like, no, I don't think it's a strong or viable, whatever, however you want to categorize the Pokemon com viable competitive Pokemon in this, in this regulation. However, it is good in the same way that Seijun's Pachirisu as just a raw Maridon counter is. Or like, I was talking with Lee mm -hmm. all weekend, like, nobody's running Assault Vest, Terra Fairy, Rhyperior, because, like, if you run that against the Maridon, they straight up cannot play the game. Like, Dazzling Gleam does five damage, Electric Attacks do nothing, and Draco Meteor does nothing because you're a fairy type, right? Like, yeah. so I'm like, if you run a, tra a like, a, counter trick room team that is prepared for Mariah. you can run Rhyperior, right but nobody used it because it's better pokemon out there. so this iron valley i think if i were to get you know talk to you to i think it was just his anti Mariah on pokemon of choice which we saw all weekend Sajin patrisu so many other terra terra grounds and terra fairies and uh other things that we saw all weekend so the since he does not have a uh, Maridon, you have to have your own booster energy to activate your speed boost. Iron Valley is incredibly fast. Um, it is, I think it's 116 or something like that. So it would speed tie with Whimsicott, but because you have the speed boost, you're going to outspeed it when it's not uh, prankster based. And one of the big values that Iron Valley gives you is non prankster encore, which sounds bad. You're like, no, but prankster goes first. But prankster encore is stopped by dark types. So on, so you can encore Grim Snarl into clicking Light Screen three turns in a row. You can encore a fit, you know, uh, 
uh, a, a Incineroar in, that could fake out the prior turn where the Whimsicott cannot because the Prankster is not able to work into dark sects. So we've seen that before with, uh, we call it like manual taunt or manual tailwind or manual encore, right? Because it's not using the Prankster uh, speed boost. And then th maybe this team that Wow Yud was testing had like a god awful Shadow Rider matchup because he has two wide guard Pokemon in both Pelipper and the Iron Valley. The one question, like, I wonder how many times he clicked coaching all weekend, especially because the Iron Valley and Cali Ice speed tiers are so drastically far apart that, like, really you could only coach or Shifu, who, like, that's the only, that's the only move that I wonder is I wish coaching, like, I'm sure it helped him get there for sure. But, like, if I was looking at the team, if you asked me, I probably would have swapped coaching with, like, close combat or something, or I don't know if it gets close combat. Like, another move. Uh, for the Iron Valley slot, but I see the potential, and clearly it worked out for him, but, like, that, I still don't think it's a good Pokemon, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, I think where I get caught up in for it as a, oh, it has Wide Guard, and, you know, it's a natural fairy type, it matches well into Maridon, but it's, my favorite move to click on Maridon is Voltwitch. You know, yeah. like, being able to get that amount of damage and pivot out, um, so many games open with that, and Iron Valiant is not a redirecting Pokemon, so okay, well, the Maridon wants to stay in and click Draco. It can do that into any other of the five Pokemon, and they would definitely not appreciate that hit. Then nothing resists, nothing is like they all will just take the hit. And if you're taking that from a Specs Maridon, you're cooked anyways. So that's kind of where I'm not really vibing with it as much as when I see like Sajin's Pachirisu. It's like is Patrice the best Pokemon in this format? Absolutely not. Is it a hard counter because, you know, it's the Volt Switch and the Terra Fairy? There's nothing that can be done? Yeah, plus with Follow Me. Whereas since this one doesn't have a redirection and you're not necessarily hitting for the most amount of damage, I just don't really... I don't know. Like, I... Oh, he also only has two Protects, by the way. Protect on which, um, Cali Ice like and crazy. Detect on our Shifu. There was one game I casted where I think there's only one Protect. I'm just like... What are these people doing out here? Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Like, I, I wish I could have watched more of, like, Yuta's games to really kind of have a handle on this Iron Valiant, because obviously important part of the piece is being brought into this matchup. It was brought in, I believe, all three times for the Masters Finals. I didn't get to catch that game one. But, there, so there is a utility here. Um, but as you said, like, I feel like there's better coaching mons in the meta. You already have Wide Guard on the team. It seems... It seems like it's cooking for a certain reason. I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a believer. I really, the other thing is the choice scarf on Landorus. Like, so it makes, it makes a lot of sense because we're used to choice scarf Landorus Therian for the last decade of VGC, right? Like, oh, super fast ground attacks make electric type scared. And uh, specifically with uh, Landorus Incarnate, the, both the earth power and the sludge bomb really threaten the electric types and then the grass types, which as we know, uh, I think Gabby and I did the math that, like, uh, there were only, I think, six grass types or seven grass types total. Like, they equaled 100% of the of the field or whatever. Like, uh, like there was, like, two Serena, and then the rest was, like, the Rillaboom, and, uh, Rillaboom Amoongus, Ogre Pond Forms, and Whimsicott. So, like, the Sludge Bomb just does work into all those grass types. But usually, Lando I needs that life out, or that life four boost from Sheer Force. So I'm so surprised that Yuta was able to pick up the KOs he needed with Sludge Bomb without the life four boost, because you're essentially losing an additional 30% damage on some of those bulky Rillabooms, or even if it was a bulky Whimsicott or, or something like that. Um, so it makes me think that he didn't really click it that often and instead went for, like, we saw him click Sandsty or Storm multiple times on stream and then also just go for the Choice Scarf U-turn consistently. Um, yeah. yeah. That's the big difference to me compared to Navjeet's Lando. And then, hold on, there's a, uh, and then Diego got top 16 with the, you know, Zamazenta, Titar, Latios team. Um, that, that Landers is also Life Orb. So I think that was probably yeah. the big tech on Yuta's end was this Scarf. He lost it on 30% damage, but it gave him way more uh, swapping potential. And he was faster than Maridon, faster than, you know, all these, uh, these like, Pokemon in the 130s in speed. 
I mean, that's what I kind of like when I look at the Lando being the choice scarf, I look at the U turn because I'm thinking of especially match into like a Maride on that you could like lead that and kind of pressure out the gate. And if you think it is going to be a Draco meteor, you could just U turn, bring the Island Valiant in, and all of a sudden you can't get hit. And they're never going to hit an electric move into that Pokemon. So I think that maybe there's some cheeky things or even just like like softening things up so the other Pokemon can take care of them. But I'm definitely more of a life orb person which you're talking about nj's team you're talking about diego's team i just gotta say three canadians in the top 16 crazy deserve a lot of credit crazy. yeah canada popped off i mean canada absolutely popped off like let's go shout outs to to justin knox is the sole american in top 16 but you know, we had a lot of, I think we had multiple, yeah, with three, three Americans lose that uh, asymmetrical round cut with Wolf, Keanu, and Grant. So, had the potential for greatness, but, I mean, we got to have the conversations here. What's going on with, what's going on with USA? Like, Canada crushed it. Give me three in top 16, but, like, this was, this ended up not being our year on, on home soil. I just got to say, what the fuck, like, the funniest tweet that I saw coming out of this when it got confirmed that, like, three Canadians were in top 16 was oh usa like spend so much time like comparing which is the strongest region because there'll be like the com the conversations like which region's the strongest um is it like socal is it new york like etc and they're like they spend so much time talking about which region is the strongest whereas canada has like two like just two cities and like the top players are from there and like top players in na like at that point are just from the cities like being vancouver two from toronto and one from um, Vancouver, but they're saying like the two from Toronto. Like I was just like the yeah. funniest thing. I was like, yeah, we'd be kind of popping off, but um, no, Canada is strong. Like I For sure. simply as that. Like um, obviously we got to feature NJ's match, which and it was a fast two zero, and it was funny because like obviously there's a lot of matches to pick, but like early on I was like, guys, I'm like I know NJ, like um, been to events like with him, like I know he's a strong player and he's got Reggie Alecki, like. Just like throwing this out on the radar super early on. And then he top eights. Yeah. <laughs> it was just kind of one of those, like, it was funny to like have called it. Um, Kylan actually beat Wolf in the uh, that first round of Swiss, which was like the significance of that. Um, there's a team Canada like Discord, obviously just all the Canadians, but they just had like somebody was streaming their match off their phone. And everyone hopped in the Discord to watch that match going off. Off of somebody's phone just kind of going off, like, the side stream. Which I think was really, really cool to see kind of all of Canada come together for that. So it was a, uh, Canada, Canada was doing good. Maybe we didn't win the event, but, you know, we're all, we're all proud of <laughs> our remember, Canadians there. Uh, I remember when we were hanging out with NJ on Monday. I came to him and I was like, hey, you know, at the start of the weekend... It's all Wolf. It's all USA, baby. It's, you know, all this, all this American pride. And by the end of the weekend, with how great Canada did, North America supremacy, baby. NA coming together. Top cutting world. You know what it is? I, I called that. Lose. I, no, no. I called that out after, like, <laughs> after your last American representation got knocked out. And um, I was like, the Americans are going to start claiming us now. I'm like, this is not allowed. Like this, I didn't say it on broadcast. It was backstage. Yeah, yeah. But like having that discussion, because obviously that was a huge discussion point for us was like Kylan knocking out Wolf. Um, I was like, don't you guys dare go like trying to claim Canada. Like absolutely not. Because I, I, I know you. I know you. North America with three, three top, top 16, you know, we're, we're great as a, as mm. a, as a Yeah, continent. okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. But yeah, that was... That was a little bit cool. It was also cool. Um, I did end up doing two interviews on the um, Saturday because um, Lou got injured. Um, but originally, I was only slated to do one interview. And it was so funny that the one round we pull a Canadian is the one round. Because I didn't, I didn't have any decision making in this. Normally, like, everyone will chat, but kind of preference goes to who's casting. I didn't have any decision making. But it was so funny. The one round I interview. They pull the Canadian, the Canadian wins. So I got to interview, got to interview my friend. So yeah, there's my, there's my Canada um, propaganda, but I thought that was a, uh, like, that was a, that was a cool, that was a cool moment. Seeing everyone like freaking out in the discord about NJ winning and freaking out over Kylan winning. We didn't get to see Diego's matches, but everyone was super proud of Diego as well. It's just like, it was a cool thing. Um, but yeah. Let's go back. Let's go from Canada to Italy here, Sierra. Yeah. As we talk about our world champions team, Luca Cherubelli, Maridon winning worlds. And this team 
I think what's so cool is that this is probably different or a different strategy, I should say, from the beginning of Regulation G. There are still similarities. Like, I know Ra- Rajan still had uh, Whimsicott, right, with the Maradon back in uh, in Indy. But, like, this team feels different. It feels like this is the culmination of the end of a format where the World Championships, you, you hold your secrets together with, like, a, with low-kick iron hands, which became really popular as the, the format went on. So, like, I like that. Uh, the Ogre Pond Hearth Flame as well, making it on to the team. Like, I, this crew, this team of six that Luca has, which multiple Maridon players actually ran this exact same six. I'm not sure if they team built together, what their EVs were, if they, you know, happened to come to the same great idea. Um, but, like, it's like all six of these Pokemon can provide, like, offensive and support value. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the... Uh, the Maridon has Volt Switch to give you pivot potential. Ogre Pond has has Follow Me to save a teammate, but it can also crit on the uh, on the Ivy Cudgel, and then Urshifu does Urshifu things. Iron Ants has Fake Out, but he can do a lot of damage with Wild Charge, and he gets the Cork Drive boost because of the uh, Maridon. Whimsicott, Moonblast, you can hurt all those dragons out there, but uh, the Light Screen makes your Assault Vest Iron Hands essentially untouchable. And then Whimsicott with its defense boost can just click psychic noise and, you know, helping hand every turn. Like this is just, this is a very well-rounded uh, team. I feel like I give credit to Luca and his friends, whoever came up with the squad. Yeah. And I want to highlight where like, we do see the differences as well. Cause obviously like Maradon won the first event of the format and it's going to win the last one. Um, putting aside the fact that um we're going to be returning back, back to right. G. <laughs> we'll, we'll forget about that. But, yeah. um, I just think this is a really good kind of little calls along the way. I think like the Ogre Pond Heart Flame in general, having that follow me and just like you could go on the offensive or protect, I think is just absolutely fantastic. I do think with this team, like this was better, but I do think like the Ogre Pond Corner Sog that Rajan had on his team is also just really beneficial considering how strong Ivy Cudgel is into a lot of things. Um, so both of those I kind of, I kind of do like. Um, when we're talking about the low kick, um, I wanted to call out because you're talking about like people bringing that to world championships. I believe that was an originally a meta call and development coming out of Japan because um, they do a bunch of tournaments. And then I first caught wind of it um, from somebody who was playing in a Japan tournament. And they're like, wait, this kind of wrecked my team. Like this actually kind of really wrecked my team um, because of the damage um, low kick. You do more amount of damage depending on how heavy the Pokemon is that you're using it against. And I think the way I said it on broadcast is uh, we have some beefy boys out here. So all of a sudden, this starts to do a lot of damage and good pressure. Um, So I think that was just a really cool adaptation as opposed to like the 75 base power you get from the drain punch. Um, But it's just like those little things that I think was just like really, really beneficial and for graph proving that it's still just like the goat out here, Um, which, yeah. Also, what was cool to see because we did actually get to see it on broadcast, was Terra Bug yes. on the Iron Hand. I think the first time I recall seeing Terra Bug was actually from NJ, funny enough, on Raging Bolt, because you resist ground-type attacks. Yes, I remember that. Um, and then I never really saw it too much, because I think it's pretty niche, like it's for certain matchups. Um, but then got to see that again, because you resist fighting ground and grass, and that's actually pretty pretty cool resistance so that well, was really cool we got to see the iron hands i was gonna say i think there was a bigger terra bug story this weekend in the juniors finals with terra bug iron treads i didn't he, get to watch that oh one. Oh my god he clicked the two games in a row and gabby and i were just besides oh my ourselves. goodness it I was so that. good oh my goodness yeah i um i was still in hair and makeup um oh, okay. it was they were actually like she had just started my hair and the talent manager came out and they shoot they're like we need sarah out of the chair in five minutes and like they're like no <laughs> and then uh, like, they're like get over here so they had somebody like eat one person doing each side of my hair to try and get it done at asap which was really funny um what i just i'll have to go back and watch that match i wanted to go back and like watch it anyways but that's funny you could, you could do a, a rewatch with your stream I could. I got shinies to catch, though, dude. There's Regulation H coming up real fast. I got a shiny sure. Piplup today, so the first Reg H team I can make is an Napoleon team, which is going to be Ooh. Which can is you gonna catch be me fun. Uh, Shiny Armor Rouge, one of the worst shinies in existence? 
I don't know if I hate myself that much. I, shiny, I caught a shiny Pocleo <laughs> after, and it was a water hunt. So it was a lagging. I can see it. And like, I it took me two and a half sandwiches, and I complained the entire time. The entire time. Every every like 30 seconds, I'm like, I hate this hunt, guys. I absolutely hate it. So yeah, I don't think I'm going to do, do that to myself. But um, yeah, I mean, I feel like this was just like, looking back, when I look at this event and the meta in comparison to last year, I think this was just really cool overall. Like, I think I don't have any complaints. Of course, the big three did the big three things. And maybe for people who don't play as much competitive, um, they just see, like, the common use Pokemon. They see Urshifu at, like, 61% usage day two and think that maybe this isn't, like, a fun meta. But I think, like, all the Pokemon you use surrounding the teams and how people were able to play, I think, is a pretty... High school like i think this is a really good way to be ending off the format yeah i think one thing that i hope people that started playing competitively in scarlet and violet get from from worlds this year is this is how worlds used to feel right last year was regulation d it was the first event nobody had any idea what was the call what's the play what's everyone else running and so it felt like some teams might have gotten away with certain strategies that would have been punished if, as if the format had progressed. And this year is how Worlds used to feel. It was a culmination of the events prior of meta ups and downs and different decisions and everything that led to the World Championships. And the team adaptions that we saw this weekend felt like that was a Worlds call. That was... You know, putting Ogre Pond there, putting Assault Vest, uh, you know, low kick Iron Hands, putting, you know, even like we had all four Ogre Ponds in Top Cut, right? Like all four forms of it, which is just, uh, it's just absolutely crazy. Like even some of the teams, like shout out, like I'm, I'm scrolling through Brian Collins from, from Team Ireland, his Lunala, um, Oki Dogi Ursa Luna team. Crazy. You know what I mean? Like some, somebody was ground on iron jugulus out there like this is this is the fun that worlds used to bring that everyone was like oh my god you show up and like this is the completed version of the format yeah i did want to normally we don't really talk about the juniors and the seniors match as much i know we talked a smidge about the seniors but i want to talk a little bit more about this because i feel like something we don't get to do enough as on the broadcast um is talk about like kind of the stories that we see in these younger players and if you look at down the line like there is multiple players that still compete who are a winner in like their senior season they are a world champion in their season like junior season um so like first starting off with juniors i think like the biggest thing going into this is uh kevin Hahn won one euic one naic has won multiple i think it was like six regionals seven total. regionals seven regionals nope. And then now world champion. It's going to be in seniors next year. And like, that's like, what a way to be ending off your last year in seniors. It's just like, internet's internet's like world champ, like crazy. No, I mean, Kevin's a stud. There's no way around it. Like, uh, it's also funny because he's had, you know, he's had one of those young growth spurts already. So he's significantly taller than a lot of the other juniors. And it's like a Man. lot of the memes of like, you know, like, uh, like Benjamin was like, I am twelve, and like because he looks. So, I, I feel bad. So Let the poor kid play the game. No, no, no. I love, I, I love it. Um, but uh, Kevin is like kind of a local. He uh, technically, I can't claim him. I, I received official word. He is not from the state of New Jersey. He, him, and his family travel to New Jersey for locals, so I can unfortunately not claim him. However, I have gotten dumpstered by Kevin at a PC before. Um pre growth spurt by the way when he was much shorter so it hurt it hurt even more at the time than it would now now that he's like you know a billion feet tall i'm like all right i get it but this was like young squirt uh kevin and i was talking with other uh nj players and they also have lost to kevin at locals because juniors and seniors you know when they don't have anyone to play against at pcs they just get put against masters right so yeah. uh, i think that's probably helped him in his his growth one his brother's an international champion in the prior age divisions and two he's playing against some of the best players in the world in the tri-state uh locals but like i had so much pride as i was the caster that got to cast him as a local 
uh winning winning worlds and juniors like it felt like the whole region was coming together supporting kevin like it was it was just as important for kevin to win juniors for us our little group uh as it was for if you're rooting for luca or yuda in uh in masters finals so um it was it was a really awesome match too like tatsuomi put on a fantastic show with that iron treads uh zamazente went to game three like i'm i'm really happy with how the game turned out but of course just super excited that kevin is uh is a world champ now. Now he's going to go crush it in the seniors. It was such a deserved like world championship title. Like I was definitely rooting for him. Like I, I'm excited to go back and watch that match. Like I said, I didn't get to watch it, but that was like, obviously when they split up um, the caster duties on who's on juniors, seniors and uh, masters, I knew for the get go, we received this assignments a bit back. I knew for a bit that it was me and Leon seniors. And without knowing who was in seniors or anything, I was just like, kind of low-key wish i was on juniors because i think <laughs> kevin's winning like i think he's winning yeah so it was kind of funny that he actually did end up being in the junior finals and then ended up winning like you're talking about lending your voice to like this historic moments and like i think if kevin keeps playing like he's definitely going to be someone to talk about but then finding out who we had as the senior finalist i i was actually glad like to be casting this um i got to interview luke Kroll after his win in indianapolis he won the first um reg um g event um with i believe it was karaidon actually out of all things and i've attended locals where luke has been at and we've played so it was kind of like yo like it was it was really really cool so seeing that match i obviously when there is the draco miss game three unfortunately i think a lot of people like to hyper focus that in on, on that on the match mm -hmm. but like ray and luke both played like phenomenal and i think it was just like a really good match overall. Like I think we got really lucky with our final matches as well. Sometimes, sometimes yeah, they can sometimes, be little clunkers on Championship some, Sunday. Sometimes it's the LASC finals where it's a fast two zero. You know, like sometimes it'd be like that. But we got really, really good matches across the board. So it was like cool because Ray's only started playing um in this generation of Pokemon, and Luke as well. I think has been playing since twenty two. So both fairly new players um and luke this is his final year in seniors i believe before he jumped masters next year so an internet's win second at worlds like that'll be that'll be cool to see what he gets to do in his rookie season next well, year you want to you want to hear some uh some behind the scenes lore about the juniors match so oh, no. uh gary and i we got to meet with the the players and their family um before like wow tcg masters finals are going on right there's a translator there obviously um you know i'd seen kevin and chris and his, and his mom and i was talking to them saying hi uh out of legitimately nowhere sierra gabby just starts speaking japanese and having a conversation with tatsuomi like gabby's just like i don't know if it's fluent or conversational or whatever but like she's pretty damn good at japanese and just started talking to Tatsuomi and the translator, asking him questions about his team and, you know, blah, 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 and his decisions, and how long he's been playing, and blah, blah, blah. I was so impressed. I was like, what oh, the... I, I've never heard her speak Japanese a day in my life. What and she she's just, did? I I know. It was it was so awesome to see. Like, I was watching, like, Lightning in a Bottle. Like, it, this was such a cool thing. And they're going back and forth asking questions. I'm trying, I, I asked, like, a couple questions to the translator. And the kid was awesome. He was really nice. Uh, but then she asked him who his favorite Pokemon was in Japanese, obviously. And he said, uh, he said, Horsey, whatever his Japanese name is. We looked it up. Oh, okay. Horsey. Oh, and she goes, oh, I like Badoof, but whatever its name is in Japanese. He's like, oh, you know, he thought that was cool. And then oh. I, and then I went, I was like, and like, I just like, in the conversation, I was like, me, Lizardon. Cause I don't know many Japanese Pokemon names. So that's Charizard's name in Japanese. Right. And he goes, Oh, that's hard. And like he pops off when I said it. And he like he like high fived me and the translator said, He said that's cool. And I was like, Yes, this little child thinks I'm cool because I like Charizard. Let's go. It's because you have the same taste as a junior in your Pokemon. <laughs> I don't know many <laughs> Japanese I don't know many Japanese no, names. I just threw Lizard so on cool, out there. Oh. I don't know, Gabby's like what? the validation I got from this child, like looking me up and down, me, like and high fiving me because I like Charizard. I was like, yes. Oh my goodness! I have to ask Gabby about this Japanese now. That's crazy. It was. So I impressive. had no clue. Yeah, I had no clue. It was awesome. All right. Well, once we're on that subject, 
That actually reminds me of something else somebody asked in our Discord, asking about funny behind the scenes moments that we're able Ooh, to share. Okay. That's definitely a cool moment, but any like funny ones or like anything that's like behind the scenes that is like, so, hey. I would like to consider this both funny. It's not funny on my end, funny for everybody else, and a more of a fun fact than anything. Uh, that my Saturday outfit. Uh, so that was a brand new suit. I had never worn it before, and I got it tailored back. Or I like my one of my local uh, suit stores that we go to had like a you know a sale, like a buy one get one free, whatever. And so I bought suits for Worlds, and I matched what Gabby was gonna wear and stuff. So I matched that. I bought that suit to match Gabby's suit. I'd never worn it before. Like obviously, I tried it in the store, and then the tailor like he fixes it up while you're wearing it because it's usually baggier than you know it's larger than usual, um, and then <laughs> they tailor it for you. So. I get. I, oh, get I think the pants I know where on. this is going. I get the pants on. I t- I could not stand up every time I sat down. These they were going to split in half. The the legs were so tight that like I was stuck on the couch at one point. Like I was sitting next to to Zoinks from the Unite team and uh, Kyle Sablehouse on my other side, and I was like, "Boys, I'm gonna need help getting up because like I literally was like snake off the couch." To like try to get the fat because I could not bend the bottom half of my body because the legs were so tight that it w- if I did it would just but, like I asked Sony to charge my phone once because I couldn't reach the thing and he was just like oh okay like he I was like I'm in pain bro I cannot I, I'm a, I'm like a girl in a skin tight dress right now like I cannot move my legs to save my leg but nobody noticed on broadcast because you know I'm sitting down and we're standing. He's dead. We're standing off camera, but like that's my fun behind the scenes story. Is like Saturday, I I was like a girl wearing heels for the first time. Like I could not move. Oh my god, that's actually. <laughs> I uh, I meant to ask you about that because I heard from someone else something about you and your pants, and that like they poor like you're being suffocated by yeah. them, and I'm just like thinking like oh, I can't be that bad. The tailor like... just made them crazy tight. I don't know why. Oh my goodness! Bring him the skinny jeans back in style, but you yeah, know what the I guess the I, should have, I should have tried them on before uh, before I went to Worlds, but you know. Oh my goodness! Um, uh, behind the scenes thing, um, that is pretty funny. So, um, I'd spoken to you briefly beforehand about this, but um, so if you guys have ever seen like those camera shots, like in the crowd, like the ones that like zoom in, those are big like cameras that do that that are on like this whole i forget what they're called a rig uh yeah on like this rig so it's like this huge thing and these hammers go fast i have been at events where these have hit people and for some reason i thought like like i don't know like it's they have hit people and one event i worked it wasn't a pokemon event it actually hit someone so hard they had to go get stitches um at the closing ceremonies me Gabby, Rose, and Lou are on the stage, and we're like on the stage. We're on the caster desk. There's only two chairs, so Rose and Lou just cast the finals. They're sitting in the chairs. Gabby's kneeling down. My dress, which is full of like sequins and beads and stuff, um, was painful to sit in. Um, it's not even painful. It's uncomfortable because like the little beads would dig into my legs, and I wasn't vibing with it. And I got long legs. So if I'm trying to sit down, this dress is riding up. I was wearing shorts, but I'm like, I still am not vibing with this. So I was standing. Um, at one of those crowd shots, the rig comes along and hits me in the back of the head. Thankfully, the wires go down like two inches before the actual camera in the rig. So it was the wires that hit me. And I still mean to go back. This is very early on in the closing ceremonies. I wanted to go back to see if like you could see a camera stutter. From when it hit me because it hit me. And if that, if like that thing was like two inches lower, that would have been like catastrophic. No, like, Sierra. no, like genuinely, like those things move fast and they are heavy. That would have been right to the back of my head. The stage is right in front. Like I would have been like off of the stage, like not to mention the gaping wound in my head. Like that would have been a emergency hospital visit so like it's funny because that didn't happen but um yeah it did hit me in the back of the head so there's your little that's crazy that's your little fun fact of it um yeah you made it through though i lived i was not the caster who ended up going to the hospital so (laughs) right Uh, I, i also every time we went out to the stage 
uh, they had like the little, you know, the little uh, thing in front with the line or whatever, right? Um, so you couldn't just walk in front. I was like a, a pigeon seeing like a clean, like a clean window. Every time I just didn't notice it, and I always like ran right into the into the strip, like almost tripping myself into the stairs. Every time I forgot, like oh, I gotta walk around the stairs to to Ooh, get in. Um, another behind the scenes one, which is actually really funny. So um, they getting ready in the morning. Like our call time on the Sunday was um decently late, and then Ugarte gets a message from Arash Amadi, and he's like. Hey, Sierra's interviewing me later. Can you ask her what she's going to ask me? Um, and Joe asked me, and I'm like, I'm not interviewing anyone. Like, what do you mean? He's like, what? He says, Garasha says, you're interviewing him for, like, the friends and family interview. And I'm like, that is not me. That's Anna. Like, I'm not interviewing. I'm just casting, right? Um, so then I was like, but tell him I'll ask Anna. Um, so I ask Anna. Anna's like, I'm not doing this. And I'm like, what do you mean you're not doing this? So I go back and I'm like, am I doing this interview? Um, but apparently like, it was kind of like a half throwaway comment. Like, Hey, if Anna can't do this interview, like who's, who's going to do it. And then uh, the response was like, Oh, my next pick Sierra. So then instead of like, Oh, she's maybe doing it. That was just then relayed to, um, um, Ayuma and Arash. Sierra's doing your interview. Yeah. Even though I had no clue. Um, <laughs> so Arash silly. knew like, two hours before I did that I was interviewing him, um, which is kind of funny. Like, I, didn't I, know, I actually didn't know this happened. Yeah, so like, I don't, I don't mind, like, I have, I have interviewed, I'm no stress about it, so I, I genuinely didn't care, but it was kind of just a really funny moment. I'm trying to, like, focus on the seniors cast and like, oh yeah, you're doing this now, and it was a rush who knew hours before I did, so. And then it ended up being funny because, like, neither of the finalists had much to say, so then I was like, joking about it with them like these two and i'm like well since they had nothing to say like i put along like friends to kind of break this down a little bit more so it was it was funny but yeah i uh I, it is people would be surprised how fluid every situation is backstage not just not just like when lou got her and then that swaps and then scott casts over her and then everyone changes the schedule around and but like even things less severe than you know a caster getting injured a lot of the stuff is kind of i'm not not last second but like very fluid right like we can go either yeah. either direction i think people would be surprised how much is kind of you know decided in the moment or on the fly but with that i think we're at a point for our question of the week well we did we did kind of forget one thing here sierra is that kind of a conversation about where worlds is next year and the year after first time ever we get two worlds yeah. locations dropped at once that's, that's kind of a big deal that's true i forgot about that um so first off no legends yeah announcement not surprised, not surprised but i will just say like not surprised but still sad um worlds anaheim i mean i didn't go to the last anaheim worlds and whatever like i don't I thought it was I'm LA very... I, when the, when the the graphics I started. I thought it was going to be LA. I'm very indifferent. Is I think the best way to put it. I kind of had the expectation after Yokohama that there wasn't going to be anywhere too crazy for a little bit. Um, I think Honolulu kind of was like is still like a little bit difficult to put together. Um, I think like the San Fr like the Anaheim then San Fran I think is a little like odd. The fact that they announced it, I think, is hilarious. I mean, you have to, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. we all, we all saw the article, but um, I don't know. I think indifferent is the best way to put it. I, what's nice is that regardless of whether I am on the casting team or not for next year, um, Anaheim is an a, is a event that I could still go to. It is still across the country, but I wasn't gonna go to Hawaii, for example, right. if I wasn't casting. I there was just. It was too too much of a travel. It was too expensive. It's not happening. Anaheim and San Francisco, like I can do it. So that part is like nice, but on like a oh this is like cool. It's just kind of like oh whatever. It'll be fun because it's worlds. But I don't really care about the location itself. Yeah, I think I'm kind of with the. I'm like I'm more confused than anything. Like because it's now it's almost a decade later right it's not exactly but before it was san fran then anaheim and now we have anaheim then san fran like a decade later and like i don't know i mean i hope it works out right uh 2017 i have a lot of fond memories watching anaheim obviously so um 
I think I'm probably more excited for Anaheim than San Francisco, but like it still is a bummer. And I understand European fans they're talking on Twitter. Like it's a, a bummer to get to Hawaii and then two California worlds, you know, consecutively yeah. three years in a row. I understand the EU fans. I would, I would say that like, it's also depending on your income and anywhere, like it's all, it also could be difficult from even uh, American or North American players to get yeah. to uh, uh, California two years in a row. So I don't think it's just a, an, an EU centric, uh issue but you know maybe there's good contracts maybe there's like a big uh a big glow up from the last two times that or the last one time each that uh we've been there so i was just more confused because like i thought it was la when the graphics started and then it said anaheim so it's not like i was bummed i was just like oh okay i don't know you know i don't know the landmarks as well as i uh as as i thought i did but yeah see like the one thing is this like where i was disappointed is I thought it was going to be Nashville, and I have been to Nashville. Nashville is my first world, actually. But I was excited for that. Even if it was a repeat world, I was actually really excited about the prospect of Nashville. And if it was somewhere we hadn't been, like, as a world, I was excited for it. But then Anaheim was just kind of like, oh, I guess it's cool because I haven't been there. But beyond that, it's just kind of like, ah, like, I don't, I don't know. The only cool, like, the only part that I'm excited about is, um, actually invited my family and specifically my mom to the world championships in Hawaii. Um, and she is like messaging me on like the Sunday and afterwards being like, you know what? Like she didn't end up going. And she's like, I really regret not going. Like, I actually really wish that I went. And I was like, she's West coast Canada. So I was like, good news. It's at Anaheim next year. Like it's a very doable trip right. for her. So like on a very like specific situation, like I'm excited because like, I don't know if the rest of my family will go if it'll just be my mom. Um, probably she's like casual enough fans. Like my mom always asked her to bring her like stuff back for her. Yeah. Um, she plays her Pokemon Go, right? So, yeah, that's kind of like a yo. Like my mom, maybe my sisters will be there next year. Like that'll be that'd be cool if they can make it. So also like I don't want to be a technical guy over here. It seems to be my my thing. But like people can play all oh, three in America in a row. Like Hawaii was also hard for a lot of Americans to to get to with you know prices and. And things yeah. we actually for other reasons other people didn't go to hawaii so like i don't think i don't think we should count oh three american worlds in a row like uh, hawaii's kind of destination it's kind of it is yes it is america but like i don't think it counts the same as san francisco you know it's it's like the people who are saying that obviously hawaii was more difficult to get to like i don't think it's an easy one for americans to get to but it was even more difficult for like Europeans. Absolutely. So it's, it's like very difficult to get to. Yeah. So like I could see where the gripe is because you're definitely not wrong that it wasn't an easy event to get to for anyone. Um, but when you're looking at the people who then like the travel is absolutely absurd yeah. over like just slightly absurd, you know, I could understand like where the complaint in, especially it too, since it is Hawaii, West Coast, West Coast. It's like at least if it was East Coast, like yeah. flights into like the East Coast, um, airports aren't that long like it's about the same for me to get to europe as it is for west coast like it's actually pretty okay but i can understand it's like hawaii west coast west coast like really like that kind of yeah. kind of does suck for people who travel more it was funny though seeing the uh, australians who usually have the worst travel possible for everything and they're like i think one of the shows i talked to i think it was like just a nine hour flight or something right and yeah there's like, like, oh, like yeah, only just nine, hours? nine hours like compared to 21 hours or or, or whatever oh no, my goodness yeah but we'll see i'd love to know like people's thoughts about it but like at least for people on west coast and like west coast like a lot of times like maybe don't have the event best event draw like i moved to like i moved out to ontario back when events were a little bit more self like seldom but like trying to travel out from vancouver kind of sucked and was super expensive across the board which is why i wanted to then move to where it was easier for me to get to pokemon events so you know what kudos kudos on the west coasters that's yeah. all all right question of the week now time. we're ready yeah now we're ready how can i forget right all right do you remember what the question of the week was you're the one who picked it <laughs> what this is news to me what are we talking about hold on Hold on. I thought you I picked, picked it. the question of the week. I thought so. I thought we were just like pulling general questions from the from our question of the week Discord channel, and we were just kind of answering. We actually, them like kind we... of kind of like answered a good amount to we, them. Oh, like wait, during. we got one we didn't answer technically. 
technically Lee Fierro's question. Do you see this one? We technically didn't I was actually that. I was actually thinking of that question, funny enough. All right. So um, go, go with that. We'll go with that one. All right. So this question coming out from Leafy Arrow. What Pokemon do you most look forward to trying in Reg H? Because yeah, new regulation time. So yeah, we'll definitely talk more about Reg H next week and the new, you know, the new information that dropped this week as well on, you know, CP standings and, you know, whatever. Um, but like, oh, Pokemon, like, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be basic and say Arch Aladon. Like I liked Arch Aladon in Regulation G. I had used it a couple times with some uh, some on uh, Battle Stadium. Uh, like this Kyogre Arch Aladon team that was really fun. Um, but now it's like it went from like a cool Pokemon that I like because it was low usage to now it's super popular. So now I can't enjoy. Good. it. Yeah, I got to be the hipster about it. Uh, so of I course, can't, I can't say Arch Aladon. Um, I mean, Armor Rouge is slightly back. I still don't think it's that great uh, as it used to be, but I think it's more popular now. Um, I, I'm going to say, like, either Meow Scarada or this. I've been hearing, I've been hearing talk, Sierra. The, the streets are talking. People are saying that. Hisu- what are the streets saying? Hisuian Decidueye kind of slaps in this format. I have not actually seen it because I've not done any reg age testing whatsoever. But from okay. some of my friends I've talked to, they say Hisui and Decidueye kind of a big deal. So that would be okay. like the first time ever Hisui and Decidueye is relevant. So I would, uh, I guess I'm I'm gonna be excited to try that Pokemon out. Okay, okay, I'd be I'd be intrigued. I haven't I haven't got to do too much with reg so far. So the first one that I'm excited to try out is Empoleon. Like I. I don't know if I mentioned it before the podcast or like during the podcast, but um, Both. I've been shiny hunting. Okay, perfect. Uh, <laughs> even better. Um, shiny hunting some Pokemon for Reg H, and it just so happened there was a Piplup outbreak. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna grab this. But Ugarte has so graciously um, said that he would help me build some teams, and by help me, I mean he would build them <laughs> and I would play them. And so he's built me an Empoleon team while we we're recording the podcast because I caught the shiny Piplup. There you so, go. That'll be fun because I'm going to like uh, make rental for it and like make a YouTube video about it and hope that it's good. And like Joe normally makes good teams. So that'll be super exciting. And then like on an actual note, like I'm excited for like Volcarona, obviously, you know, okay, modern, modern day Slitherwing, but Volcarona in general is just like super strong. So it should be, it should be good in this format. So I'm excited. Uh, speaking of rental, shout outs to Magi for yes. doing what we couldn't, which is making a rental code Thanks, of our Moggy. Lunala team. So uh, you're the best. Anyone wants that for any uh, premier challenges they have in the next two weeks? Yeah, you know, more than welcome to DM Magi and get the team there. But uh, I guess we'll like repost it at the beginning of Regulation G next yeah. year when that comes back. So you'll, yeah. you can you'll use have that a team, team right yeah. from the get go. Exactly. Perfect. Um, but for that, I know um, you should rest your voice. Yeah. Um, so we are going to wrap. And this was a long episode, even though we didn't think it was going to be that long. So we're going to wrap this up now. But thank you all so much for all the support on the first year of the podcast, because this is a yeah, this is a, another world championship done. So thank you all so much. We'll see you all in the discord. We'll see you all next week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Oko. We'll see you real soon.